My name is Sarah Flynn, and I've been a certified court reporter with the state of Arkansas since 1994. I'm also a certified verbatim reporter master, a real-time verbatim reporter, and a certified legal transcriptionist with the National Verbatim Reporters Association, who is the nationwide licensing authority for voice writers, whether it be court reporters, cart providers, or broadcast captioners. I'm also the owner and lead instructor at International Real-Time Court Reporting Institute, where we have been training voice writers since 2005. And please let me introduce to you one of our real-time certified graduates, Kim Ray, who is a certified verbatim reporter and a real-time verbatim reporter. She works in the state of North Carolina. Kim will be doing a real-time voice writing presentation for you as I'm speaking in just a little bit. So I have two goals for today's presentation. The first is to get you excited about the best career you've never heard of, court reporting. The second is to get you excited about the court reporting method that I use, which is real-time voice writing. I'm very passionate about both, so I hope I can stir up the same excitement in all of you today. So first, let's talk about what court reporters do. We are the ever important keepers of the record of court and deposition proceedings. Now, there are two types of court reporters, and those are officials and freelancers. Official court reporters work in the courtroom. They have a salaried position with the state or federal government. It includes great benefits such as health insurance and retirement. Now, some official jobs here in your area are offering huge sign-up bonuses as much as $30,000 in addition to the already $100,000 plus salary. In fact, it's the most lucrative career that I can think of that you can have without a traditional college degree. Official court reporters hear and report motions and trials, either criminal or civil cases, such as car accidents, medical malpractice, and so much more that you can't even think of. <laughs> Now, the other type of reporter is a freelance reporter. This is what I do. And this reporter will work for one or more court reporting agencies. And you go out to different places and you report depositions. I'm sure you've all heard the, the, hear, the saying that there are no surprises at trial. That's because when a lawsuit is filed, each party has the right to discover what the other party is going to say at the trial of the matter. And this is where they take depositions, which are question and answer sessions where the person, the deponent, is placed under oath to see what they're going to say. So deposition testimony can also be used in court to rebut testimony. If they say something different at trial than they said at their deposition, it's used to rebut that testimony. So depositions are very important as well. So both types of court reporters are going to hear things that are different every single day. Both types will take their notes and then we prepare written transcripts of those proceedings so the attorneys and judges can review them later and court reporters are charged with accurately producing the record from our notes. So court reporting does take some training. Now, I get the question all the time, why can't you just record it and have AI make a transcript and eliminate the court reporter? Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> when papers are ruffled, there's interfering noise, people are talking over each other, the digital record is then distorted. Machines cannot differentiate between different dialects. They cannot interrupt when something is not heard or understood. They cannot play back questions and they cannot punctuate the spoken word properly as court reporters are trained to do. So court reporters are a vital part of the legal process. We're not going anywhere. I think we have the best job where we're kind of the fly on the wall, listening and reporting everything that's said and that's why I've been doing this for almost 30 years now. There's always something new that you're going to hear. And even after 30 years, I'm still shocked at some of the interesting stories that I hear. 
You may have even watched the recent Murdaugh trial where they had both a voice writer and a machine writer both reporting the trial proceedings. I bet that was a very interesting trial to get to report. So now that you know what court reporters do, let's learn a little history about the voice writing method itself. Where did it come from? In the 1960s, a man named Horace Webb invented the first steno mask. It was a really big one. <laughs> and he also invented the voice writing method of court reporting. So he just happened to come into contact with a naval officer who had just been tasked with finding an alternate method of court reporting. It just happened at the same time. So the Navy liked his method. They adopted the method in the mid 1960s and started teaching it in lieu of traditional machine writing and the older shorthand pen writing method. So the voice writing method itself has been around pretty long time now. So the way I got started with voice writing back in the early 90s was that English happened to be my best subject. I love to read. <laughs> and in high school and college, I worked as a legal secretary for several local high pro profile law firms and the legal profession really excited me. I had higher aspirations of being just a secretary, but I knew I didn't wanna put in all the time and money into the schooling it would take to become an attorney. So in my office at the law firm, Court reporters would come in and take depositions, and I noticed that some of them were using this mask thing. I didn't really know what it was, and others were using a machine. So a legal secretary friend of mine who was training herself to become a voice writer, because back then we didn't have any voice writing training programs to, to speak of, and she's the one that handed me an old-timey mask, the, little, the real big one. <laughs> and a tape recorded course by Mr. Horace Webb and told me that she thought I would be good at this. Well, so I trained myself with the help of that course. I went out and took and passed my test the first time and the rest is history. And that was 30, almost 30 years ago. I'm aging myself. <laughs> so now I'm going to ask Kim to share her screen for you. And she's going to start voice writing as I continue speaking. You're going to see her real-time text come up on the screen as she is dictating into her silencer mask, which I will talk more about here in a moment. So do we have Kim's screen? There we go. Now let's talk about the history of real-time voice writing. In 1997, the first voice-to-text software, Dragon Dictate, came out and computer processor speeds were beginning to get faster and faster. Real-time voice writing then became a reality and it's only gotten better and better. In 2005, Betty Keys, another real-time voice writer, invented and developed the voice writing theory that most of us use today. With the use of that theory, which I'll give you some examples of in just a moment, coupled with ever-increasing computer processor speeds and advances with the Dragon software, today's voice writer can produce instant voice-to-text using the assistance of a CAT system, which formats that text into a transcript. Some real-time writers produce a feed to attorneys and judges, but most real-time writers just do real-time writing for themselves, eliminating the need for a typist. After the proceeding is finished, then we simply proofread and perfect our transcript before producing it to a judge or an attorney. So where voice writers were limited in the past due to technology, Today's properly trained voice writers can produce real-time text, such as Kim is doing here today, provide readbacks to attorneys and judges, interrupt for clarification, and report all different kinds of dialects. Again, things no recording device will ever be able to do in our lifetime. <laughs> Voice writers provide the exact same services as machine writers, 
and get paid the exact same salary and page rate. We even take the same certification exam. However, machine writing schools have a 92% average dropout rate among their students. This means only eight of 100 people will make it all the way to certification. With machine writing, students are required to learn a completely different language before starting speed building. In voice writing, we use the English language that we already know, and we can start speed building right away. This is how we can train voice writers in one year or less, whereas machine writing students average three to four years to get to test level. All right, so Kim can stop sharing her screen now that we've seen the real-time text coming out, and then we can continue on. So now that you've seen real-time voice writing in action, let's talk about the equipment that we use in our training program. First off, we use a silencer mask such as this one, and we will teach you the art of real-time voice writing. It's definitely an art form of dictating correctly because Dragon, our speech recognition engine, it's just a computer program. It doesn't know what we're trying to say. It's listening for sounds and it's going to make a best guess match as to what that sound is compared to the 350,000 words that it comes with in its base vocabulary. So then we add in our theory words to that vocabulary to get our desired output. We'll couple Dragon with Eclipse Box or another computer-aided transcription program, or that's what's called a CAT program. We use Eclipse Box, and a CAT program is going to enable us to format our transcripts correctly, and it builds them in real time as we're dictating. So both machine writers and voice writers will use a CAT system, but a voice writer only needs a souped up laptop computer, which runs around $1,200 to $1,400 in lieu of a $5,000 steno machine. So we, our costs of equipment are a little bit less than those of a machine writer. So now let me give you some examples of the theory that we can use to shorten up our dictation. So just like machine writers, we use briefs. We can say the non-word brout and get the output beyond a reasonable doubt. We can use the acronym RDMC for reasonable degree of medical certainty. That's a lot of syllables. <laughs> or we can use the non-word leggy for ladies and gentlemen of the jury. And that's just a few. Everything is totally customizable in a voice writer's theory. So what works for one voice writer may not work for another voice writer and vice versa. So we can customize everything. So when you're looking for a voice writing program, you want to ask about your instructor's certifications and whether they have produced real-time graduates. A good voice writing program is going to teach you a voice writing theory, proper dictation techniques, they're going to teach you punctuation of the spoken word and extensive transcript production training in addition to building your speed to get to that test level. Dragon and Cat software training should also be included. So training to be a real-time writer is going to take dedication, just like machine writing. It's going to take daily practice and motivation to get it done so you can be on your way to a fabulous career. So I want you to make plans to set goals for yourself and go after your dreams. <laughs> now, most voice writing programs are going to take a year or less to complete. The program that we have is an online program. It's built so that students can go at their own pace and on their own schedule. We have constant interaction with our instructors. We have been around since 2005, and we have trained hundreds of voice writers throughout that time. So with the current shortage in California and also with so many seasoned reporters getting ready to retire, we need you 
to join us in this fantastic field so we can keep this profession alive for decades to come. So whether you're right out of high school or college looking for a career, you're a stay-at-home parent wanting to get back into the workforce, you're a midlife career switcher or whatever the case may be, my best advice is to not walk but run to a voice writing school that fits your budget and your needs and to start training right away so you can have a high paying, lucrative, and best of all, exciting career in less than a year. So thank you again for hoping me, hope, letting me hopefully get you pumped up about the court reporting field, the fantastic income opportunities, and more specifically, the voice writing method. I will be putting my contact information in the chat, and I'm glad to answer any questions that you have. Now I'm going to hand it over to our graduate, Kim, who is going to share with you her own personal experience with voice writing and training to be a voice writer. And then after that, we'll hand it back over to Stephanie and Cindy so they can speak with you about the California CSR test eligibility and the job market here locally. And then finally, we'll have a question and answer session to address any other questions that you have. So Kim, it's your turn, take it away. Good morning, California. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, my name is Kim Ray. I live in North Carolina. I have been a court reporter for seven years, so not very long. I am I'm not in I was not in this for a long, long time until I found Sarah and she trained me and here I am today. Um, let's see. Uh, just a little bit about my past as far as career goes. I spent 25 years doing something completely different than this. I was a hairdresser. I was a uh, inspector for the State Board of North Carolina. Check, you know, if you've ever known anything about hairdressing and salons, they had to be checked for cleanliness and stuff like that. Well, that was my job and did not like it at all. I didn't like being the bad guy that showed up once a month. Um, but I got to the point where I was tired of standing on my feet all the time. I was getting too old and I'll be 57 this year. So I started this career right about 49 was when I think I went into school. And by 50, I was hired on as a, um, a resident reporter for North Carolina, an official. Um, I take that back. I wasn't a resident. I was what we call a rover. In North Carolina, we have rovers and resident court reporters. Residents have a courthouse or a district that they are the only court reporter in. And rovers go and take up the slack everywhere else. If a court reporter who's a resident needs to be on vacation or they have something you know, happen in their lives and they have to take off, then that's when a rover comes in and takes over. Or if they have a criminal trial and a civil trial going on at the same time, a rover would come in and take one of those. Um, at about a year ago, I had a judge ask me if I would please be his court reporter, and uh, he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I did that um, along with going ahead and getting my RVR, um, but I will back up to my CVR. Like I said, I went to school um, at International with Sarah. Uh, during the time I was in school, my mother was very sick and had pancreatic cancer. So I think that because of that, it took me a little bit longer to do school, but I still finished it within, I think, seven months, maybe eight, um, and was going at it right away. I was lucky enough to have people in my life that I learned from that taught me. I'm going to tell you right now that if, if and I hope this is a, a, a job that you're thinking seriously about doing, whether it's an officialship or freelance, find you a mentor. Mentors are everything. Um, they can help you along. If they're like me, I have people sit all the time with me in court because they want to see what an official does. I did the same with a previous uh, student of Sarah's who happened to be a, an official in North Carolina, and I sat with her in Charlotte in court a couple of times just to see, is this what I really want? Um, and I found out really quick that I wanted the stability of that paycheck every month, my insurance paid, 
paid time off, all that good stuff. That was really important to me. Um, so I got my CVR, I wanna say maybe two months. I passed all but one section at my first sitting, which was my Q&A, which ironically is now the thing that I am best at um, because I'm in court and I do a lot of question and answer. Um, but I, when I got the job as the resident, I went in there and I decided, you know what, I, if I'm not going to do this now, I never will. I paid my money. I studied for my RVR and I took it before I could change my mind. And it turned, you only have to pass one leg of it. I passed all three. So it tells you how much, how much being in court and working on a daily basis really helps you build your skills, which translates to school, practice, 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 practice practice. Um, you'll find yourself in the car, driving somewhere and listening to NPR and repeating everything they say. Um, so that's, that's the best way to learn is just to constantly do that. I did that as a kid with songs on the radio. I'm, I'm sure other people do too. You sit there and you repeat everything they say. But um, so yeah, I've, I've been doing this now for six years as as an official and um, hopefully we'll make it another six or seven years. Things have really gone um, bonkers since COVID and we're trying to play catch up because a lot of people just sat in jail. They were afraid to bring anybody up to court because we didn't know what was going on. And so now I have court probably, I have court every day pretty much, uh, but I have, I do civil work, which if you don't know what civil is, it's when um, parties sue each other, you know, whether it's uh, vehicle negligence or anything like that, um, all the way up to uh, alienation of affection, which is extremely interesting. Um, and then I've done uh, this past year, I did four murder trials, um, which took up a lot of my time, but I'm happy to do that. It's, it gives me an opportunity to build my dictionary and to build my skills and to make myself better and better at what I do. So um, I'm married. I put myself out there to help a lot of people, which my husband says I have a spring loaded right arm every time somebody says, can you help? And I'm like this all the time, um, but I enjoy what I do. And I think when you love what you do, you help others to love it as well. And you try to show them everything that you have and what you can give to them and what they can give back to this. This is a great, great job. And, you know, nobody's paying me to do this here today. I'm just here to kind of pass the word along and to see what you can do, as you could probably see from what I took down. Yeah, you're going to have a couple of times where a wonky word comes out, but that's easier than having to go back and type the whole thing to fix one word that came out wrong. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I probably have six or seven more years before I retire and I might do some freelance stuff then, but that's the best thing about this job. You retire and you can still work and you can tr do transcription. You can. I work for the Capitol Defender's Office sometimes and I do uh, Sheriff's Department, Police Department interviews. I help them out with that and be able to certify a transcript for them. Um, so I'll be able to work until I just don't want to do it anymore. And if you love what you do, the old saying goes, you're never working. You enjoy it. You enjoy it. So I'll send it on back to whomever goes next. And then if anybody has questions for me, um, I'm happy to answer. And if you want, I can put my email in the chat as well. So if you want to contact me or if you want to move to North Carolina and join <laughs> us, you're welcome to. Oh. I'll give you some information on that. So, here. <laughs> all right, back to who am ever now. Well, before I move on to the next part, I was wondering if you would just hold up your silencer mask so they can sure. see it's not the big, huge thing from the 1940s anymore. Yep, this is um this is the older style, which is my favorite, and I wish Talk Tech would bring it back again. It is my favorite. I baby this thing, literally. I will sit there and and baby this so nothing happens. But you can see this here is called a muffle mitt. It helps kind of absorb because this is plastic. And I really feel like when you talk into it, if you're not uh, muffling it, then you get a little bit of reverb or echo in there. And on my screen, it'll just say him, 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 because it's getting a little bit of an echo. So I put a piece of foam 
I'm gonna try to get it out. A piece of foam down in there. And then I use, this is just a little piece of sham wow that I cut up and I wash before I use it. Otherwise I get little bitty pieces that I suck in. But um, I use that in there. And then I put a straw just inside this little hole that's in there. And there is one on the new mask too. It's just not as accessible, but I did do, I do have a, a backup. I have backups to my backups. So I have three masks. I have two computers. I have, I have tons and tons of stuff that I spend a lot of money on. But um, this, this is the best way to keep the moisture out for me on this mask was putting that straw on there. It draws the moisture down so that my microphone doesn't get all wonky from you know, the moisture that's in there. And that helps with recognition too, right? Dragon needs to hear you really clearly, exactly. but we don't want to hear you outside of the mask. No, and I, and I purposefully unmuted my microphone. So hopefully nobody heard me. If, if you did, if you heard, I've had a couple of bailiffs said that, that they would hear us whenever I had a lot of S's to say, but they could not tell what I was saying, but they would hear every once in a while. Um, but uh, I, I have a courtroom where the witness sits right next to me. So I've never had anybody say anything, knock on plastic, but yeah, I, so far so good. Good, okay. And I think that's, you know, one of the misnomers too, is that voice writers could be disruptive in the courtroom because they're speaking but um, with the right mask and the right equipment, it should be completely silent for anybody. Exactly. Who... And and you yeah. and I tell my judges, I get I do get traveling judges every once in a while. And I say, look, if I can't hear them, do you want me to say something or can I ask you? And he says, you do whatever you have to do so you can hear them. So I, I do have that in the courtroom and I have great judges and, and it's always good to have a judge having your back on things. Well, thank you. Thank you for You're that welcome. presentation. Um, you are welcome. We've gotten a couple comments that the transcript didn't scroll, but I think from the one page that we did see, it oh, was I'm sorry. perfection. No, it was perfection. And I can print it out and send it to you if you want. I, I'm sure it's not necessary. <laughs> Technology, right? I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what I thought I would do before I bore you with my little profile and um kind of say, why California? Why now? I just wanted to remind you that although voice writing has been something that's been going on for decades, it's new to California. And that's why we're hosting these webinars. Um, the legislation was just passed in October, signed by the governor. So we are really getting the word out that not only is this a fantastic new technology available to Californians, um, the schooling is so much shorter than the traditional machine steno. So whatever you know, career you might be looking at or in now, you can make a six-figure income with training that would be about a year, um, less than that for people who may have some steno in their background. So uh, before I go on, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? If you'll raise your virtual hand or your physical hand. There's a question in the chat. Stephanie, can I read it out loud? Yes, please. Uh, there's actually a couple, but uh, Kim mentioned assisting the police department with interviews. Is this something you can do as a second stream of income after hours or on weekends? I currently work in the courtroom as a courtroom clerk and I'm looking for something to just earn extra income. Well, it is something that you can do, but I would, I, most of them, and I can't speak for any other um, state but North Carolina, when you transcribe these things, they really want to have it certified. So getting your certification allows you to certify that transcript. I do not know how it works everywhere else. I do have a couple of clerks where I work that went and got trained to be a transcriptionist for the state of North Carolina so they can certify. And they went to the NVRA and got their certification for a, tr a transcriber. So they can certify their transcripts. Um, so getting that done, if your state offers those kind of things, absolutely. Or just talk to somebody in the sheriff's department or talk to somebody in uh, California who's in the know about whether or not that's something you can do without getting certified. The next question is, how are you keeping your voice healthy? Me personally? 
I yell at my husband all the time, so it stays warmed up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I you, I don't know what to say about that. I, now, when I was testing, I would actually sing at the top of my lungs in the car, driving wherever to test. I drove to Atlanta, and I sang in the car. I war- it's just, it, this is your tool. This is this is one of the tools, the most important part of of the tools that you have. So taking good care of it. I drink water all day. Um, My judges take breaks all the time. Um, We take, we work for an hour and a half, take a break and so on and so forth. So lemon juice, a little bit of honey. It's just like if you were a singer, you know, just take care of it. You don't scream at your kids too much. Don't, you know, don't try to sing Mariah Carey. Don't, you know, don't do that. But, you know, take good care of your voice, baby it. And Stephanie, I see some hands raised. Okay, do you want me to call on them? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a question first from Turquoise Trotter. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, I have a question. I am in California, and I'm actually uh, making a transition from steno uh, to voice. And um, I got to 200 words per minute and got to qualifiers. And I want to voice right now. So (laughs) um, I have a question about like when you're talking about mentors and when we have to like sit out and everything, because I know that voice writing just came to California. So like, how do we in California go about finding mentors and, you know, things of that nature, since the majority of us are steno writers? I think that's a that's a good question. Um, I would say you could reach out to your state associations, CCRA, um, Facebook has a lot of student groups, and we're offering mentorships there. Uh, what part of California are you in? I live in San Bernardino County, so I live close to LA and San Bernardino. You know, like, oh yeah, so I'm in LA a lot. I know a lot of reporters. Then I went to school with uh, one of your reporters in LA. Yeah. Janet. Um, but uh, like I said, I just know that voice writing is uh, new here. I will have to reach out to uh, CCRA because I'm not on Facebook. I don't have social media. Um, so yeah, so CCRA will be uh, like who I have to reach out to. So would that be you who I'm reaching out to or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, any of us on the board, there's an info at Cal ccra.org. You're welcome to email right into there. Uh, Cindy, as the president of the LA Court Reporters Association, I'm sure she has uh, reporters in her courthouses that would be willing to mentor. We do. And uh, LA County is pretty vast. So I'm sure we have some reporters who actually live in outlying counties. Um, We know reporters who work in court in San Bernardino County. So Finding a mentor for you will be very easy. Just go ahead and put your email in the chat. Um, but just so everyone knows, we LAFRA is working with CCRA to build up a mentor list so we can we can uh, get everyone who is looking for a mentor, a reporter to work with. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Sure. And I think I have another question, but should I wait and wait like, for the other people? Um, well, why don't you ask it now since you're unmuted? Okay. Um, I know that, um, this is kind of a a software question and this will probably be for the voice writers who are actually in here because from what I'm told is Eclipse basically the primary software that we use as voice writers. Like, is that pretty much this, the go-to of what we should get? There's a couple of different CAT softwares out there. Um, a lot of steno switchers we get are already using CaseCat. Um, you, CaseCat does have a voice module um, and our Dragon training does allow you to continue working with CaseCat. I would say that Eclipse Box and Audio Scribe are the main voice writer software that software companies that we have a, a lot. I think the majority do use Eclipse Box, but AudioScribe is 
only for voice writers. They don't have a steno version, um, but that's another good. So it's really Case Cat, Eclipse Box, and Audio Scribe are the main three. Okay. Thank you, Turquoise. How about Thank me you. next? Hi. Um, so I know that COVID really transformed um, freelance work, and I'm just curious about the demand for freelance voice writing that is done remotely via Zoom, for example, post-COVID. Um, and then also curious about what freelance remote work could look like if I move to a state that doesn't allow voice, but I am certified in California, for example. Um, so I was a I was a freelancer for 26 years and I joined the courthouse shortly before COVID. I became an official. So um, I have many freelancer friends that work solely remotely. They don't go in person anymore. And, um, you know, frankly, we need people to go in person. That's how, that's how business gets done. I'm in the post COVID world. You know, many people don't want to go back in person. Um, so there is going to be a continued job market for that, but I'm seeing more and more people being drawn back into the conference rooms and the law firms and the doctor's offices, wherever they're holding depots. But um, I think that, I don't know if Kim or Sarah want to speak to it. I think that the remote work is still plentiful in California. Okay, great. Yeah, it seems like you can get more jobs done remotely if you're, you know, factoring out um, uh, transportation. Yeah, especially in some of our busier metro areas <laughs> like LA. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Um, Julie, did you have a question? Um, so I live in California as well as the first person. Um, I haven't started school yet, but she started to answer some of my question. Would I have to go to school for voice, voice writing and steno? Because the, I live in California, like it sounds as if from what she said, voice is coming to California. So does that mean I should go to school for both at the same time? Because the school I was planning on going to, I don't think has voice. Um, would you guys recommend that kind of thing? Be, uh, and how would that work in terms of, uh, do I need both? It just sounds like uh, kind of juggling, like I would need the steno machine and the voice thing and the different software. I could do it, I'll do anything. Um, but where do you guys, just tell me what to do. Like I, I kind of have a mentor in Sacramento, but she does the steno, she didn't know anything about the voice. So this is perfect because I could see what my life would look like perhaps, but maybe 10 years in the future, it won't look like that, so. Right. So that, that's a good question. If we didn't um, clarify that enough, I'm glad that you asked. So traditionally in California, the only way to become licensed by the California Shorthand Reporters Board is steno machine mm -hmm. using the 22 keys on the machine. So what happened last October was we added the additional method of voice writing. So now you can do either or. Mm -hmm. So we do call them both steno. They're both stenography. It's just that voice writers are doing it with their voice and speaking those briefs that Sarah mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. whereas the machine steno reporters like I am, uh, we write them. Mm -hmm. So you would not go to school for both. You would pick a method. And we mm -hmm. have, you know, like earlier Turquoise mentioned, she went all the way to the 200s in, in steno. You know, I, I've had students put aside their steno Mm -hmm. machine to pick up voice with the intention of, hey, this job market is hot. I'm going to get in here and I'm going to start earning my way. Uh -huh. And then maybe I'll pick up the machine again in my spare time. Uh -huh. We have other people who are doing the opposite. They're like, I'm going to finish my steno machine and uh -huh. pick up voice as a backup because God forbid, what if something happened to my hands or my arms? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good, um, I'm going to school for voice. Mm -hmm. after 30 years of being a steno machine writer because I'm very interested in the technology and and why not I'd love to have that as a backup mm -hmm. but um I will tell you that uh, I'm sorry to interrupt but I will tell you that we have um, a lady who's here and if you're on any of the forums on Facebook for um, court reporting you may have seen her name her name is Tori Pittman um but 
she was my mentor and she taught me eclipse and the ins and outs and I worked for her doing scoping with some of her her work and some proofing just to train myself but she was a uh, machine writer Mm -hmm. and took up voice because it sounded interesting to her and about three years ago she was hiking and broke her arm and she ended up being able to use that left hand to hold up her mask versus using a machine. And she said, you know, she's never been more thankful in her life. Now, I know that that's something that it would be hard to do both at the same time. I couldn't even imagine. Um, But I've had people sit down with me that were the same as, um, I'm sorry, I think her name was Turquoise, that Turquoise said that um, she couldn't get past a certain point. So she Mm -hmm. switched over to voice. But so where I live in California, um, I'm in Northern California. Could I skip like a steno school? I mean, I'm sorry, uh, traditional court reporting, do voice and have a job where I live? Or is voice like uh, designated through courthouses? Because I'm in Northern California, but not in the Bay and not in Sacramento. So I don't know if you guys have always with the how does it work in California like could I just go rogue and be a voice reporter a voice recorder in Northern California skip skip the traditional and still have a job or would I need to commute to the larger metropolitan areas does that make sense it does make sense and so with the legislation being new and the law mm-hmm. being new we don't have you know I think we have two actual voice writers as licensed CSRs now because they just passed this last March test. Uh huh. So it's so new. I mean, I think it will take a minute to right. infiltrate the entire state. But right now, what we have are courthouses um, willing to hire voice writers. Obviously, the freelance market is going to be on a firm by firm basis, right? Uh-huh. But the need is great. Attorneys uh-huh. want a licensed CSR. And it is written into the legislation that people can't discriminate. If you hold a CSR, a valid CSR license, it doesn't matter regardless of the method that you're using. You're a CSR. Okay. You will find work. And, you know, we are busy. CRA and LACRA, we're busy um, educating. We're educating employers. We're educating steno reporters, depot firms. We're we're working for you. Okay. And you're in LA, correct? I'm currently in San Diego. Okay. Um, okay. I need, to find, I need to find you. <laughs> I'll, put my, I'll put my email in the chat. Okay. And Cindy is in LA. We have Priscilla up by you. Priscilla Goldie. Okay. Um, yeah. We'll get you. Okay. Again. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Ashley, you had a question. Uh, I have two questions. One is about certification and one is about software. Um, Oh. Yeah, I'm just looking into voice writing. Um, one of my questions was for the CSR, um, once you get certified through voice, are you just like generally a, a CSR? Can you do steno or voice or do you have to distinguish? Um, I'm going to let Sarah answer that one. I'm not... I'm not super sure of your question. I think she was asking the question, if you pass the CSR, could you do steno or voice? And the answer is you have to certify, I believe, in the method of which you're going to report. Correct. Okay. So, yes. Like here in Arkansas, if I wanted to, to, to do stenography, that to be certified as a, as a certified court reporter in that method, I would have to go back and retest in that method. Okay, yeah, I just, that that makes total sense. I just um, wanted to hear that. And then um, I'm using CaseCat right now, and I hear Eclipse is really good. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to learn it. Um, But if I was to continue with CaseCat, what are the drawbacks to CaseCat? Like, I have not worked with CaseCat personally, so I do not know. I know a lot of steno writers work with CaseCat, and a lot of steno, like they'll be in steno school with case cat. They'll come over to our school and they continue to use their case cat in lieu of Eclipse box. 
So I, I hear they're pretty happy with it. I just can't give you a personal experience because I have not used or even worked with CaseCat at all. Okay, so maybe like you can't share files, right? Like if you're on Eclipse, if someone's on Eclipse and someone's on CaseCat and you wanted to work together on something, you wouldn't be able to do that. I don't think so. I because Eclipse has what's called an ECL file, and I'm sure mm -hmm. CaseCat has their own proprietary file. You might could do it, but usually you're going to be working with a scopist or someone that's on the same system as you are. Okay. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. And Sarah, in that same vein, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Justine in the chat had a question. How long do you recommend working as a voice writer? scoping your own work before you find a scopist? I recommend at least one year, if not more, to get to that real-time level because as Kim was saying, the way you're going to get all the, the basics in school, but the only way to increase your real-time accuracy is to actually go out and take work come home and scope that work and correct and make dictionary entries or make up new code words where something's not coming out properly. You have to really work with your own work for at least a year, if not two years to get up to that real time level, because that's the only way you can improve is to encounter mistakes and correct those. And, and to follow up on that as well, it's it, it only helps you to get better. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want to spend seven days a week working. I have grandchildren. I have a husband. I have dogs. I, you know, I have I want to have a life. Mm -hmm. So uh, making my work better saves me time at home in working and producing that transcript. So I did take work as a scopist for other people so I could learn. And it was like cut rate, you know, here, let me do it for you. I'll do it for free. Give me 10 pages and let me practice and let me do what I have to do um, until I got to the point to where, you know, I really don't want to do anybody else's work but my own because I know the quality of my own work. Okay. Um, I see Turquoise has a question. Yes, I actually have a statement. Okay. Um, and this was in uh, this was in regards. Well, I see some people answering the questions now um, about which schools are uh, offering the voice writing method. And so I see that uh, Downey Adult School and Downey um, and West Valley College are also. And I actually just attended the uh, seminar for West Valley. And if uh, any students in here aren't aware, they are tuition free. Um, their courses are uh, like non-credit, so you can't transfer them to like another university. But if you attend there and you're a California resident, you don't have to pay. The only thing that you have to pay for is your is your equipment, basically. And their summer session, uh, they will be having another um, informational session on May 12th, I believe. I have the email, like I could put it in the chat and everything, but they'll be having another informational session for their summer session that'll be starting in June. If anyone was uh was curious about that. So thank you. That was just something. Yeah, because I've done I've done some um I'm actually already enrolled in a school and I've done some peddling uh on my own. Um I uh I am a veteran student so I don't know if anyone in here are uh veterans from the military but um as far as the schools that accept our benefits um, are the College of Court Reporting and uh, Tri-C, I believe. That's another school that accepts our benefits for voice writing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Okay. And I plan on moving to San Diego, actually. Yay. Yeah, yeah. so I was happy when you said that because that is the city where I'm going. <laughs> and you're going to work in court, right? We need you in court. Yes. If, and I'm a, I'm a voice writer, court report, that's been my dream to be in court since I was a little girl. So it's like a, it's a, it's one of those for me. Like it's been my dream because I love the judicial branch of my favorite branch of government. Right? Yes, um, I, I love it. To have you. So yeah, so those are the schools. Like I said, West Valley College, they have some informational sessions coming up. If people are looking to enroll, you know, I'll leave that in the chat. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Turquoise. No problem. How about Sandra? You have a question? Yes, I do. Actually, I was looking through the chat and most of them have been um, answered. So thank you very much. Uh, I also live in Northern California, pretty much Timbuktu. I work in Sacramento, so I'm spending about three hours a day on the road, which I'm really over with. But um, should I do this in Sacramento? Uh, eventually, I want to move to San Diego because that's where my family is. How difficult is it to move from one courthouse, let's say it's, it's court work, one courthouse down to another? Is it just like changing jobs or is there an entire process that has to be gone through? I don't know. Cindy, do you want to take that one? I, I do. It, it's a simple process. So the only thing I would say is, you know, it's, it's, this, it's the same process. You would contact San Diego, let them know you'd like to apply, provide your license. And after that, it would just be a matter of the interview and the hiring process. What I would check is uh, your retirement benefits through the first court system that you're working through, and then make sure that those um, years that you've earned there carry over to the San Diego Superior Court. I'm not sure whether or not there is reciprocity, but that's certainly one of the first questions that I would ask, because as we know, working for the court system, one of the benefits is a, a very nice retirement package. So that's what I would I would um, ask. And also, just so everyone knows, all the courts are hiring right now. All the courts are excited about uh, voice writers now being licensed in California. You will find plenty of work. It's not a question of how much work you will find. It's a question of can you get through school as quickly as you can? And on that note, I think Kim mentioned how much you have to practice. I will say that I went through school as a steno machine writer, and I was lucky enough to have uh, friends who were working reporters, and they said six hours a day, just practice. And they made me practice on weekends and miss, miss beach days, uh, but I did it, and I got out, and I'm, I've never been sorry. It's a great career. I encourage you, now that we have voice writing uh, in California, it's a it's a shorter method, not shorter, but um, the time it takes to become licensed is less because in steno machine writing, you're actually learning all the abbreviations. But in voice steno, you already know how to speak and probably speak very quickly. So I don't I do know of one student who signed up less than a year ago and she's already at 140 words a minute. So it's a fantastic career. Uh, I put the link in the chat about the, uh, Stephanie, is it okay if I mention the requirements now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the requirements to take the CSR, which is a certified shorthand reporter, either voice or steno, uh, 18 years of age or older, high school education or equivalent, has not committed any, crimes con con uh, constituting grounds for, for denier of uh, licensure, and the applicant must submit satisfactory evidence of the following, and that's 12 months of work experience making verbatim records, a verified certificate of satisfactory, satisfactory completion from a California recognized court recording school, and again, we put lists of those schools in the chat. Um, also, another method to qualify for the CSR is, I just passed it and I wanted to read it. You can get, if you're a, a steno machine writer, you can get your RPR through the National Court Reporters Association. And having that RPR qualifies you to take the California state exam. And now, and most wonderfully, since voice writing is now uh, welcomed in California, if you have your Certificate of Merit or CVR from the National Verbatim Reporters Association, which is voice steno. So if you have the voice steno certificate, if you have the RPR, you are automatically qualified to take the California license exam, which requires you know, a four voice at 10 minutes and a professional uh, 
professional exam where we have to know the codes uh, that pertain to court reporters in the state of California and a written knowledge test. Um, but I encourage you, if you are even slightly interested to seriously look into it, you will be walking into a job for courts at least, I, I don't have experience with uh, depo reporters and freelancers for quite a while. I did that quite a while ago, but all the courts are hiring um, right now at this time, at least until June 30, they're offering bonuses to reporters who the courts are hiring. And just as an example in Los Angeles County, and again, check out all the superior court systems in you know where you live, but just Los Angeles County alone is offering an almost $27,000 bonus for students to help repay their, their student loans. That's of course, if you stay for a period of four years, but there's signing bonuses, equipment bonuses. It's an excellent time right now to become a court reporter. So I encourage every one of you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Sure. Okay. Well. We'll go back to a couple more questions. Um, Ashley, I have your hand up next. Uh, I've completed my academics and academic and center school. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any schools that you could choose to replace and accept those academics as you take it? You have to take everything. Ashley, I'm going to I'm going to guess at your question. And if I don't have it right, I'm going to ask you to type it out in the chat. You're saying that you did your academics in Steno school and you're wondering if you have to take new academics for voice. Yes. Yeah, Good. that's court reporter ear, everybody. Court reporter ear <laughs> right there. Um, so, no, the academics are the same. So the academics that you're studying are to pass the California state licensing exam and that licensing exam the written test is the same, whether your skills are in machine steno or voice steno. So the test is um, English, medical and legal terminology, and professional practice, as Cindy stated. So um, you'll take those separately from the skills portion. And any program that you go to, even an out-of-state program like Sarah's, um, they'll offer you academics, but you do need to make sure to get those California codes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I've heard that at Downey though, you do have to take the academics again. You shouldn't, okay. but I'm not from Downey. I'm not associated with Downey, so. Um, Depends on how you qualify for the CSR. Those are more in-depth questions you're going to want to speak to a mentor about or the CSR board directly. Okay, I'm going to move on to Britt. Britt awesome. Oliver. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm coming from a completely different background. So this is all completely new to me and seems super duper cool. Um, but more just like a general question. What is like the day to day like as a voice writing court reporter? And do you have like a choice of the different types of cases that you work on? Or are you kind of just assigned to like one thing, whether it's criminal or civil? I'm going to um, take a a 10 second stab at that. And then I'm going to ask Sarah to answer um, because she's done both. I, maybe you're not an official, huh? You've done freelance. So I just wanted to say in California, um, every county is different. If you become an official reporter in the courtroom hired by that county's courthouse, um, most courthouses will have officials assigned to criminal. Some courthouses are still covering family and maybe civil but I would say a majority of the courthouses are, are criminal only. And that's where kind of your liberty is at stake, right? They're going to put you in jail. It's a, it's a penalty of um, imprisonment or liberty. Civil cases um, have largely gone to freelance in our state. And that's where money is at stake. You want somebody to either do or not do something. You you know, maybe a neighbor's encroaching on your property uh, it's a personal injury case, a breach of contract, stuff like that, um, where money is at stake, that's civil. And so if you're uh, wanting to work in a courtroom, you kind of need to decide, is that going to be the criminal for me, the family, juvenile, or civil? And then that will kind of direct your path. 
And um, as far as freelance, we don't do any criminal depots in freelance reporting. So if you're uh, interested in the depot and freelance world, you would be doing mostly civil. That's where the pretrial discovery takes place. And as part of my spiel at the end, I was going to say, um, aside from judicial reporting, we have licensed CSRs using their skills as broadcast captioners or CART. You could, you could take your skills either on the road and attend school with a deaf or hard of hearing student, or you could do it remotely and you broadcast the feed in. So you would be taking down maybe what the professor is saying and it would display on that student's laptop right there in the classroom. Or broadcast captioning, you also have the ability to be a freelance reporter or an employee. And so we know that being an employee would come with all the medical health benefits, retirement, um, and they sometimes in the cart or broadcast captioning, they'll provide your equipment for you. But if you choose to go the freelance route, uh, you're responsible for your own equipment and there's quite a bit of it. You know, you have to have like backup upon backup in case you lose power. Some people have generators. It's a whole thing. So as far as the day to day, um, I would let Kim and Sarah answer that. Kim's our official. So she's worked in the courtroom as a as a voice writer and Sarah has done the freelance. Um, I'll just say as far as official ship goes here. I do both. Um, my court, I have two courthouses, two counties that are mine. Um, so if court happens to be going on in both of the counties, then they bring a rover in to help with one of them, but I get first choice on what I want. Um, I, I personally think civil is a big yawn, but, um, <laughs> but I do do it sometimes just to kind of, you know, there, especially, it, I, this is going to sound awful, but I could do murder all day long. Um, the tough ones for me are child related. So I, this past month, I had two different child sex trials and I knew I couldn't do both of them. You have to look out for your mental health. So I was like, you know what, this week I'll take civil and let the bring somebody else in because I had just finished up a pretty nasty one. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can do both. I do both and I can do both. I, I prefer criminal. I prefer doing a nice uh, long trial to doing something about two people. We have a, a, a nice lake here um, that a lot of NASCAR drivers and football players own homes. So it's this really exclusive place and people fight over their cabanas in the way of me seeing the lake. Well, you know what, let me get my little fiddle out and let me play it because I'm sorry, you know, and you can't find a jury that's going to feel sorry for you either. I'm just going to say that up front. But yeah, so but I prefer criminal, but I do do both. And on the freelance side, um, usually if you're freelance, you can work totally for yourself. But a lot of times you're going to work with one or more court reporting agencies you're going to tell them your availability. You get to kind of make your own hours. Of course, they're going to bug you to death to take every job in the book, but you have the opportunity to say no or yes. So you can kind of tell from who's scheduled. Once you get a little versed, you'll be able to tell from the scheduler at the court reporting agency what kind of case it's going to be according to which attorney's doing it. You know, the attorneys specialize in different fields. Um, so you'll be able to take all kinds of different stuff. I've been freelancing for 30 years. I like the, the flexibility of not having to go to a courtroom every day. That's just my style. Of course, freelancers don't get the great benefits that the officials do. So there's pluses and minuses to each one. Uh, but as a freelancer, I would go out to a lawyer or, that, or a doctor's office three or four times a week, take, take my, take my record down. And then I would go home and produce the record. So the majority of your time is really spent um, at home producing that record. Great. Thank you so much. I'm looking for our next question would be Andrea. Good morning. Uh, I'm an official at Orange County Superior. I've been there for about five years. I just want to say thank you to Kim. That was a really fantastic 
demonstration. Um, I'm involved in our leadership at our at our courthouse, and the problem that we're finding is how to explain to judges and attorneys that this is not inferior, but that it's just a a different avenue. So I kind of have three questions. One of them is, what is the quickest and easiest way to explain to our benches and our attorneys that this is a process that, or this is a method that will be in our courthouse shortly? And then just kind of very quick questions. I'm curious if anyone knows how many voice writers took this last CSR and if we have the um, results for them yet. And then for the CRV, what is your percentage passing rate for that? Or what's the, you know, what percentage do you have to have to pass that test? You mean the CVR? The I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Yes. No, that's all right. <laughs> There's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> We're all learning, right? <laughs> so your question was what the percentage of accuracy is to pass the CVR? Yeah. So the California CSR is 97 and a half percent. I was just curious wow. if there was a number attached to that. With the CVR, there are three legs to the skills test. There's a literary five-minute uh, test. There is a jury charge 200 per minute, 200 words per minute test for five minutes, and a Q and A for five minutes. So each of those legs of the CVR are five minutes, and you're required to have 95 percent or accurate, better accuracy. So the the CVR test is um, the same as our NCRA. RPR. It is. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. and Thank you for that. That's why it qualifies you to uh, sit for the California CSR as well, because it's the same as the RPR. So those are a lot of acronyms for those of you who aren't familiar. So we have two national organizations. We have NCRA, and that's been traditionally around for the steno machine writers, and they they give certifications in the RPR, the um, CRR for real time, the RMR for the merit, which is a speed, a bunch of alphabet soup. And so in the last several years, we've had the NVRA. I don't know how old that is. Sarah can tell me. Um, but NVRA has taken steps to certify steno machine writers as well as voice writers. And right now NCRA is not recognizing voice. So you would go to NVRA, get your certification there. And if you do pass their CVR, that's one of the ways Cindy mentioned that you could sit for the CSR. Um, unfortunately, at this time, the, C the CSR exam that you need to be able to work in California, you need that license, um, is not accepting all comers. You have to qualify through a school or with one of the ways that Cindy mentioned with like a license or a certificate. Um, so that was Andrea's question, yes? I'm gonna go on to- oh, I'm sorry, real quick. I just really, the how do we talk to our benches and our judges about, you know, this is the same um, I'm trying to think of like a good analogy, something quick. And so I was thinking, you know, it's like a car. It's either a gas model or an electric. They both do the same thing. Is that an appropriate analogy or is there something better that I could be using? I don't know. I like that analogy. I do. Say, I was going to say that, and, and I'm going to have to step out here in just a little bit, but I did put my email if anybody had any further questions, but I, I actually had a, a, an old time judge look at me and people on jury ask me all the time if I'm on oxygen because <laughs> I have a mask on my face. Is she okay? The judges go back after the jury comes back and he talks to them and they'll always be, well, that poor lady up front, is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. She's taking it down. But I had an old school judge come and he was like, so tell me how this works. And I took my computer and I let him stand behind me and watch me. And I said, and he says, I'm standing right behind you and I can't hear you. He said, everybody said I would hear the voice writer and I can't hear you at all. So the best way for your judges, if you have the opportunity is show it to them. Don't be afraid to demonstrate it if you can. Okay, thank you. Um, Dehana? 
Oh, I like that name. Dehanna? You got it right the first time, Dehanna. Dehanna, <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> um, when you were mentioning, uh, I, I work for a law firm here in Los Angeles and family law. And, you know, the big brouhaha where there's not court reporters now in family law, only in criminal. Do you feel like that's just because there's such a shortage of reporters and that would change if there's more people in the, in the, in the mix? So I think, can I answer this one? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I, I'm an official with Los Angeles Superior Court and the shortage, the shortage is something that I think court systems are using to pull reporters out of uh, family law. But the fact is, we have plenty of reporters in Los Angeles County and outlying counties to cover these courtrooms. If uh, an attorney goes into a courtroom, they might see several freelancers in a family law courtroom. It's just the recruiting by Los Angeles Superior Court has not been what it should be. I think only in January, at the very end of January, has Los Angeles committed to recruiting? And I, I don't know if you were on earlier, but we have tremendous um, signing bonuses at this time. I think if reporters were familiar with uh, what the benefits are with Los Angeles Superior Court, there would be a lot more uh, reporters applying. So it's not a shortage per se, so much as our court has not been recruiting uh, as much as they needed to be recruiting. That's that's my feeling on that. So is the is that just for LA County then? So like in San Diego, there's reporters for all. Divisions. Some some counties uh, do cover family law, but at this moment, I'm not sure which counties are still covering. And in LA, in fact, we are still covering some family law courtrooms on certain days. Right. Um, so, yeah. so you don't think it's it's due to the shortage? It's just more of a I believe it's a recruitment issue that our court has not been recruiting like they should have been for the past several years. And they're only they only just agreed to serious signing bonuses on January 31. So it's not even been three months yet. So we'll see how their recruiting efforts go. I was trying to see if Hannah wanted to ask her question or Hannah. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Hannah. Okay. Uh, okay, so this whole field is completely new to me. I actually had never heard of it. I've heard of people talking about um, doing the transcripts, just typing it out. I've heard a lot about that. Actually, uh, I just had a conversation with someone a couple weeks ago that said, hey, you know what? I typed the scripts out, but there's this new branch starting out in California. Why don't you look into that? And she actually sent me the link to this. Uh, yeah, so I'm totally new to this whole thing. What's the schooling and the training like? So right now I work during the week from 7 a.m. to about five. How would I go about the training and the schooling? So I think someone mentioned, uh, a one-year program that they do, but I'm just a little curious as to how I go about all of that. Um, I think I would let Sarah answer that question about the schooling and how long it takes and what it looks like. Oops. Yeah, so we built our program to accommodate the working person the person that has a job but wants to retrain on the side to to do something else so with our program everything is pre-recorded and there for you so say when you got home from work you would set a schedule I'm going to go to school five days a week for two hours and we usually recommend 10 to 12 hours per week in combined school and practice time to get through in less than a year. Now, if you put in double that, you'll get through in less than six months. But if you can give us 10 to 12 hours a week, no matter what hours those are, um, you will move through. And then with our program, we 
it's not just online. We have constant interaction with our instructors. We're grading your homework, listening to your voice, giving you tips on how you can improve your dictation for real-time translation. Did that answer your question? And then, yeah, it helps, but also like, what are the different topics? Like what are the different subjects I'd have to learn in the training? In our program, we teach legal, ter legal terminology, some medical terminology. We teach transcript preparation, how to actually prepare the transcript that you're going to have to sell because that's how we get paid freelance wise. We get paid by the page, not necessarily by the job, but how many pages of transcript did you produce for this job and you get what's called a page rate. So we teach you how to get those correct pages following your state's formatting guidelines, your state's you know, rules and, and any language in your certificate or your transcript that relates to your rules. We also teach very importantly, punctuation of the spoken word, which is different from what you learn in high school or college. <laughs> in high school and college, we're dealing with complete, exact, grammatically correct sentences. When we're dealing with people speaking, it's a completely different animal. Uh, can I answer also, Stephanie? Of course. So we also uh, covered anatomy, business talk terminology, medical terminology, legal terminology. When you're a freelancer or an official, you could be reporting on any topic at any given day. It could be a case about trees and neighbors fighting over trees. It could be a medical malpractice where you're talking about spine surgery. It could be criminal where you're talking about forfeiture of wrongdoing. Um, you just have to be ready with whatever is going to be um, talked about that day. The grammar is very important. Um, later on, wherever you Whichever, whichever uh, route you choose to go, freelance or official, you will learn formatting. So you'll learn basic formatting in school. Um, and of course, speed and accuracy, which is tremendously important uh, for every, every category of reporting that there is. So I see that Sarah's back now, so I'll hand it back to Sarah. Sorry, I lost my internet for a minute. <laughs> I don't know where I was. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just finishing up saying we started 120 words per minute and then throughout the course we'll methodically build your speed up to the 225 test level okay and beyond <laughs> and beyond thank you you're welcome and Alex would you like to go next hi yes so this world is oh let me turn on my camera so I am, this world is not uh, not new to me. I got my bachelor's in criminal justice. I work for Sacramento Superior Courts right now. So this is how I learned about the seminar. Um, so question for me, because I'm up here in California, I'm interested in the voice uh, writing. Do I have to, to get my license, do I have to get it here in California to practice in California? Or would that be, can I go to other states? Or could I go to another school and get that license and work in California? Hopefully it makes sense with that. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. So in, in many states, you only need the CVR or the RPR to work. And some states don't require a certificate or a license at all. In California, you have to have the CSR license. You have to sit for the CSR exam. And that's the ways that Cindy mentioned um, earlier about halfway through you can you can get one of those out-of-state licenses that mm -hmm. would qualify you to sit a school if you go all the way through their program they can qualify you to sit um, a couple other kind of weird ways like a year of actual judicial work in another state that might qualify you but you'll need that CSR license and the written knowledge test is the same but you would um, if you want to be a machine writer, you would have to take the test as a machine writer. Like you couldn't pass it as a steno writer in on the machine and then go start practicing voice. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So California does require that CSR test. It's four voice for 10 minutes. It's the hardest test in the land, <laughs> but you'll be well prepared if you go through any of the programs. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I will just say that a lot of states do offer reciprocity with the CVR or the RV or RPR. And if you have those national licenses, they'll most likely have you take a written test over their state rules and then they'll grant you a state license. But the only ones I know of that that won't do that is California and Texas. Okay. So Cindy answered this question in the chat that we're going to have another one of these webinars in May. So uh, stay tuned. There's another question in the chat. Uh, I can answer that. The Perfect. question is, are we able to acquire all of the CPR, RPR, and other tests for acronyms after our name in any state, just not the CSR? So there's the National Court Reporters Association. That is a national national association. So any testing that you do through that organization, um, you take that with you wherever you are. For example, I have the RPR. So that qualifies me to take the California CSR, which is a state licensing exam. The RPR um, demonstrates that, you know, my accomplishments in speed and accuracy. The CSR for the state of California demonstrates that I can work in California. And Sarah, is it the same for the NV uh, Association? The Sorry. MVRA? Yes, thank you. So yes, yes, the MVRA is a national association. So any testing that you do with them will have it will be not I'm not to say good, but but most states, like I said, offer reciprocity with a national license. Um, but in certain states like California and Texas, you are they don't care what kind of license you have. You'll still have to take their test, including a written and skills test. So um, that having the. Uh certifications that Sarah mentioned will qualify you to take the California state exam. So if you have that certification, you automatically qualify to take the CSR and then you can work in uh, California. So as you know, mentioned earlier, I think we're winding down for our questions, but as mentioned earlier, again, 12 months shorter for some of you. I, Sarah's program, you know, requires you to put in what, 20 hours a week? 10 to 12. Oh, for a part time student. Oh. If you're a full time student, we want you to do 25, 25 yeah. to 30. <laughs> but but full time students, if you can dedicate that amount of time, you can get out within six months, which is amazing. <laughs> so we're talking six months to a six figure career. So, you know, you don't need a degree. You won't come out with an AA degree. It's, you know, somebody asked in the chat, can I transfer my academics from one school to another? Um, I don't work at any of the particular schools. I do teach for Poway Adult School, but I'm not like affiliated with how they run their program. I just teach. So um, I don't, I don't think schools are really allowing the transfer of academics. And I would say, take it again. It can't hurt you. The CSR test is really rigorous. You want to be prepared. Um, I don't think there is anything called over preparation. So um, if it interests you, you know, we've put a list of schools in the chat and I think I put my email in the chat. Cindy did, Sarah did, uh, Priscilla did. So we just urge you to reach out to any of us, um, a mentor through info at calccra.org. Uh, go to your local courthouse, ask for a court reporter. Um, they all would love to help you. This is the other thing about this profession. <laughs> In every other corporate structure or you know anywhere else, you have to wait for someone to like leave their position if you want to promote. But in court reporting, we welcome you. We we want you to take our job. We want there's no competition really here. You know, we just help each other all the 
Facebook groups. Um, Sarah has been working with me for over a year to bring voice writing to California. She's given her time freely and voluntarily. Kim today, it's just, it's the community that we live in. I called up Betty Keys on the phone. I mean, she literally wrote the book. She didn't know me from Adam. And I called her one day and just said, tell me everything about voice writing. And she talked to me for two hours. I mean, court reporters are just fantastic people. So if you're a fantastic person <laughs> or you want to be a fantastic person, <laughs> I would urge you. Um, Adrienne is asking, what's the name of your school? Sarah. Oh, she answered in the chat. She's fast. Fast fingers. Does anybody else have anything before we wrap it up and say goodbye? Okay, thank you all for sticking with us. This was a long presentation and I'm just really, really pleased that you all came to get good information today. And I look forward to seeing you all out in the field. That's right. Let's see some new court reporters out there. Stephanie, can I just add one thing? I'm Please. sorry. I, I just want to say to all the people here, um, I know it's not exciting or glamorous, but one of the best things about working as a reporter is that, at least in, in Superior Court, and I know the freelance world is wonderful too, but as an official, you are going to have insurance, health insurance, dental insurance, all the other insurances for your family or future families till they're 26 years old. In Los Angeles, there are two retirement programs, one that is required and one that you can contribute as much as you want to. These are not glamorous or exciting things about careers. I mean, nobody goes, oh, I'm gonna go into their this career because of their dental insurance, right? That's just not a glamorous thing. But um, when you're young, you don't really think about that. But when you're starting into your 30s or 40s, you all of a sudden say, wow, that might be a really good thing to have. And so again, um, I would encourage all of you to become court reporters, freelancers, cart reporters, captioners. I mean, it's a fabulous career. You can work in any state once you take their state exam. I mean, someday when I retire, I hope I can go be a reporter in Hawaii and just enjoy retirement that way. But it's a fabulous career. Everybody encourages you. So again, please, please seriously consider it. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah and Kim. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Sarah. Thanks for the hours that you've put in. Your presentation was great. No problem. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the recording.